It's currently the first week of Advent, and thus we have started a new liturgical year. The purpose of Advent is to spiritually prepare ourselves for Christmas. One common theme in Advent is that we as modern-day Christians should place ourselves in the shoes of those who lived before Christ. Thus, as those who lived at a point in history prior to the coming of Christ were preparing themselves for God to fulfill his messianic promises, and at the time of Christ only those who were properly disposed to receive Christ placed their faith in him and became his disciples, something similar is occurring with us, even though we live long after the time of Jesus. You see, there are still many moments or events in our life that serve as opportunities for us to grow closer to Christ. We must, through prayer, through ascesis, and through good works, prepare ourselves for these opportunities. Further, it is an inevitability that we will, at some point, in a direct and face-to-face -face manner, be in the presence of Christ. This will happen either because we will die and be judged by Christ, or he will return in our lifetimes. One of these things will inevitably happen first, and thus we as Christians are all preparing ourselves to encounter Christ. Just as those living in the Old Testament were preparing for a direct, face-to-face -face encounter with Christ mentioned in the Gospels. Thus, while Advent, like Lent, is a penitential time, the emphasis is slightly different. The emphasis is on expectation and anticipation, and therefore preparation. The human person is, in a sense, a microcosm of all of salvation history, for both are defined by a perpetual spiritual and moral process of preparing ourselves for an encounter with Christ. This is the recurring theme of Advent. To help us to prepare our hearts and our minds for Christ, let us examine the readings of the first Sunday of Advent to see what elements of the concept of preparation are emphasized, and how the message of this week's readings can help us to prepare our hearts and minds for Christmas. The first reading is taken from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. In this text, Isaiah has a vision of what he calls the mountain of the Lord's house, which is just a reference to Mount Zion. Mount Zion was a mountain along the edge of Jerusalem, which constituted one of the highest points in Jerusalem. It was believed in biblical times that Mount Zion was God's dwelling place. Isaiah notes how Mount Zion, quote, shall be established as the highest mountain and raised above the hills, unquote, and that, and I quote, all nations shall stream towards it. Mount Zion is a symbol for the church. You see, God formed a relationship between himself and the people of Israel and it is within the context of this relationship that God reveals himself to humanity. Yet there will come a day, Isaiah notes, when all of humanity will come to Mount Zion to worship the one true God, which represents the covenant being opened up to all of humanity. And this happens through the ministry of the church. As the people approach Mount Zion, they will say, quote, Come, let us climb the Lord's mountain to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways, and we may walk in his paths. Unquote. Traditionally, Mount Zion was a symbol for both the church, that is to say, that in which and through which God made himself known to humanity, as well as heaven, the dwelling place of God. The notion of Mount Zion being elevated as the, quote, highest mountain and raised above the hills, unquote, and people approaching Mount Zion may represent how the church serves to bring the light of God to all people, and that nothing can hamper the mission of the church prior to the end times and the second coming. 
This is something that parallels the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Yet the notion that the people not only approach the mountain, but also climb the mountain to be closer to God in order to learn divine wisdom and the precepts of the divine law points out how the church is the means by which and through which we grow closer to heaven, and therefore grow in closer union with God. It could thus be argued that here Zion is thus a symbol for both the church and heaven, because God is in a sense present to us in both heaven and the church. God is present to us in heaven as the place where God dwells, yet God is present to us in the church as the means in which and through which we grow closer to our heavenly home. Thus, when the text goes on to say, quote, For from Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, unquote, this could represent two things. Firstly, Zion and Jerusalem represent the church, and thus this verse can refer to the church proclaiming the gospel, which is the means by which people are brought to Christ. Yet Zion and Jerusalem could also represent heaven, in which case this verse points towards Jesus Christ, the divine word and the divine wisdom made flesh coming forth from the heavenly Jerusalem or the heavenly Zion to draw us back out of our sin towards God. Unlike in Old Testament times, Christ has already come. The core of God's plan of salvation has been fulfilled. Thus, the fullness of everything we need to get into heaven has been given to us. Now is the time to act. Now is the time when we have what we need to ascend to the heavenly Zion and grow into closer union with God. Thus, we read in the second reading, taken from the 13th chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Romans, quote, You know the time. It is the hour now for you to awake from sleep. For our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is advanced, the day is at hand. Let us then throw off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. St. Paul then goes on to describe the way of life that goes along with the lack of faith. It is a way of life defined by lust, gluttony, self interest, and envy. Yet St. Paul ends this excerpt by saying, quote, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. Unquote. In order to prepare ourselves for Christ, we must place our faith in Christ as the only one in whom and through whom we obtain salvation, and we must cooperate with God's plan of salvation in everything we say and do, because we need to order our entire lives towards the end of avoiding sin and overcoming sin should we fall into it and be open to God's grace, whereby we are given the strength to do God's will. It is by placing our faith in Christ and doing the will of God that we can prepare ourselves for the coming of Christ. As the Collect Prayer for the first Sunday in Advent states, quote, Grant your faithful, we pray, Almighty God, the resolve to run forth to meet your Christ with righteous deeds at his coming so that, gathered at his right hand, they may be worthy to possess the heavenly kingdom." Unquote. Further, the Collect Prayer for the Monday in the first week of Advent states, quote, Keep us alert, we pray, O Lord our God, as we await the advent of Christ your Son, so that, when he comes and knocks, he may find us watchful in prayer and exultant in his praise." Unquote. What we ask for from God is the grace of moral vigilance, that we may prepare ourselves for Christ through faith, through prayer, and through good works, and preserve in these good works until the moment in which we meet Christ, so that we may be made worthy of the kingdom of God. 
In the Gospel reading, Jesus also talks about this theme and contrasts the mindset of the faithful who through their faith and holiness of life prepare themselves for Christ with the way of the world. As Jesus says, quote, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. In those days before the flood, there was eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not know until the flood came and carried them all away. Unquote. It's not that enjoying the things of this world is bad. Rather, there is a hierarchy of goods, with some goods being more important than others. And sin comes about when we place a lesser good above a greater good, or place any good above God, who as the source of all goodness is the highest good. Sin comes about when we place all of our focus on the things of this world, and pursue the things of this world at the expense of growing in holiness. The flood waters that destroyed sinners represent the wrath of God, whereas the ark represents God's mercy. Those who refuse to enter the ark represent those who were so absorbed by their sin, by the things of this world, that they were either unable or unwilling to see the mercy of God. Because of their unrepentant sin, they were caught up in the flood waters of God's wrath. The same is true with Christ. Only those who prepare their minds and hearts for Christ will receive the benefits or effects of Christ's mission. We are like Noah insofar as we attend to our spiritual and moral responsibilities. But we are like those killed by the flood if we are careless in what pertains to the things of God. Thus, Jesus says, quote, Two men will be out in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding in the mill, one will be taken and the other will be left. Unquote. The notion of one man being taken away and another being left behind has been misinterpreted by some as referring to the rapture, a belief common among some evangelical Protestants which states that, at some point immediately prior to the second coming, Jesus will assume all true believers into heaven. Like literally, they will be lifted up into the sky and then just disappear. But note, what's the context here? The context is that Jesus is comparing the second coming to what happens in Noah's ark. The analogy is meant to be extended even to this verse. Jesus is, in fact, comparing what will happen in the end times with the story of Noah's ark. Being taken away is a reference to being taken away by the waves, which represent God's wrath. What Jesus is, in fact, saying is that God gives everyone what they need to be saved, but not all people accept it. Some people will accept it, while others won't. Some will therefore be taken away by the outpouring of God's wrath, while others will be spared by it. It depends on how open we are to the saving plan of God. This may lead to a sense of scrupulosity, that is, a sense of fear, a sense of uncertainty as to whether or not we're on the right side of history. But Jesus goes on to say, quote, Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on which day your Lord will come. Be sure of this, if the master of the house had known the hour of night when the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and not let his house be broken into. So too you also must be prepared, for at an hour that you do not expect the Son of Man will come." Unquote. Jesus is calling us to moral vigilance. God doesn't call us to repentance unless salvation was possible. And this is the source of our hope and our joy as Christians. That is why in the responsorial psalm for this past Sunday, we sing, Let us go rejoicing to the house of the Lord. Because we cannot accept Jesus without repentance, we cease sinning and strive with every fiber of our being towards God. Yet because God is standing there, waiting for us with open arms, and is giving us everything we need to be saved, 
That is why we have motivation to repent. Because if there was no chance of us attaining to the glories of heaven, no matter how hard we try, we would fall into despair. This, combined with the fact that there is no good greater than God, is why Advent, and in a sense, the entirety of human life, is one of both moral vigilance and joy. And this is the true spirit of Advent, and the true spirit of Christmas, and the true spirit of the Gospel.